I would like to welcome our first speaker to the stand today. A pioneer in carbon budgeting, a merited professor in energy climate change at the University of Manchester, Uppsala and Bergen, a globally known climate influencer who has also made headlines for himself by taking the train all the way from UK to China. Ladies and gentlemen, give a warm applause for Kevin Anderson. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks. Let's give us a sec. Just to get the technology working. Um, so I'm going to zoom. Share screen. Is this going to work? Yeah. Whoa. There's, oops. Yeah. There's hope for carbon capture and storage yet. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that uh, for that introduction. Um, I'm going to I've got I think about half an hour, I believe something yeah. like that. So I'm going to try to lay out um, a storyline really from the sort of framing we typically see of net zero by 2045 for Sweden and indeed for Scotland or 2050 for the UK, 2070 for India. To well, actually, what do we really need to do for real zero for 1.5 degrees centigrade? And very much, I'm framing this around carbon budgets. So, if anyone's heard me speak before, nothing significantly changed other than another 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide has been put in the atmosphere. Um, the issue of equity, and very importantly, also the issue of practicality. And that's quite what we mean by that is, is something we need to think about and discuss. Um, but I'm going to start off with a health warning, and I'm, I've got this on here really, probably less necessary in this audience, but I do quite a few talks in the UK for government departments, so I always tend to put this in. Those of you who might have seen The Matrix, this is, this is from The Matrix. So this is, this is a red pill um, presentation. So I don't like my conclusions, but you know, they are the conclusions. Um, I've not over or underplayed them. Um, the language may appear provocative, I've probably toned it down for a Swedish audience, um, but it reflects the analysis, and I think that's what we need to do. Our, our language should reflect the analysis. Um, it's uncomfortable, and again, I think about this in a UK government audience, really. It's uncomfortable within the cosy climate tales that we've been telling ourselves for 30 years and that we've normalized. Um, so uh, I hope you at least, again, hopefully in this audience that's the case anyway, you're happy to taste the red pill um, but if you disagree in the end with this, then obviously we've got questions and discussions and we've got our discussant as well at the end where we have some, we have some disagreements, but I think mostly agreements. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so I'll start off flippantly, perhaps with the... Is I too far away, am I? Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Fine. I'll try not to burst into song. Um, <laughs> for your sakes. <laughs> um, so I'll start off with a bit of science in a sort of flippant way. These are... These are what we've tried for 30 years on the science. Good intentions, Machiavellian policies, eloquent arguments, legal licenses, lots of accountancy scams, and in that I include net zero. Um, but actually the, care, the physics doesn't care about any of that. And I think that's, we have to remind ourselves of that when we talk about the real world or what's practical. Well, it doesn't care about these niceties. It only really cares about the amount of, total amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that we put in the atmosphere. So that's the sciencey bit over. Um, so where to start? So I'm going to start with the, the, the Paris Agreement. Um, just, just, yeah, it's just a bit slow switching, isn't it? Because it's, it's switching via Zoom, so it takes a little while. So start with the Paris Agreement. And what I want to start off with is um, a few years ago, the focus was really all on two degrees centigrade of warming. But now I think there's been a shift much more towards 1.5 degrees centigrade, which is at the same time has happened that our emissions keep going up in the atmosphere. So we've got a tighter target and a smaller budget. Um, but uh, and there are ways that that's been fiddled, if you like. So we've moved from one, two degrees centigrade to, to aim for 1.5, and there are some very good reasons for that. After the Paris Agreement, and it's odd that, again, it's the the analysis came after the conclusions, if you like. So the Paris Agreement says let's have 1.5, and then people said, well, what does that mean? And then we did the analysis afterwards. But so the um, the IPCC were asked to look at this and produced their report in 2018, the SR Special Report 1.5. And broadly in that, it points out that the impacts for 1.5 um, are pretty dis destructive across ecosystems, human systems, and so forth. So 1.5 is not a safe threshold. Um, but the impacts of 2 degrees centigrade are considerably worse. 
And there's certainly there's quite viable, valid science from people like Hansen and many others who would argue even at 1.5, we pass many uh, really important sort of non-linearities, tipping points. So some, some scientists suggest that even that is too dangerous a threshold and others think we will have a little bit more time to, for that sort of temperature, maybe a little higher. But let's also remind ourselves that, that our focus isn't on temperature. We're not really interested in temperature. What we're really interested in is the rate of change of impacts. So if the impacts that we're seeing from climate change occurred over a million years, so what? If they occur over 500 years, it becomes a bit more important. If they occur over 20 years, it becomes incredibly important. So it's the time frame over which the impacts are occurring that's really important. And this, this language of temperature is just a proxy for the change in impacts. Can our human systems, can ecosystems deal with the change that we're actually seeing and witnessing? And so far, on our human systems in many parts of the world are struggling with the existing climate that we have and the, 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 the norm that we have today, which will change again next year and the year after. But so, of course, are many ecosystems. And we can see that with some of the ecological destruction not just related to climate change, but broader sort of human activities. Uh, hopefully some of you have seen these diagrams before. These are quite commonly used, the burning ember diagrams they're called. And it's another one of those sort of managerial tools that the IPCC use. So what we have here is sets of impacts at a global level. And they, they are taken from really lots and lots of academic work. So there's lots of research behind all of this, and they've tried to simplify it into a, a set of sort of bars for different types of impacts at a global level. Um, and then sort of use a colour to say how bad they are and, and not unusually red is bad. Um, <clears throat> but what's interesting is that these have been updated every few years and what you see is how that the, what was initially thought to be bad at a certain temperature, that temperature normally gets to be lower. And you've got the latest set and you see the impacts look much worse. And that's one thing we have learned from the science is the impacts are much worse at lower temperatures than we thought. So we thought they would occur at te higher temperatures now at lower temperatures. And this is one of the strong reasons why we've moved from this sort of, does it work on here? No, it doesn't. <clears throat> from the two degrees centigrade framing to 1.5. And let's also be clear again that 1.5 is not safe. And the 1.5 informed COP26. So this idea of this language, rhetorical, political rhetoric really, but keep 1.5 alive. Um, and that is, I think that has also become a much more of a, um, of a framework for thinking about some of the issues on mitigation as well. So I think it, there is some genuine concern behind trying to stay at 1.5 because there are good reasons not to go above it, um, even though the chances of not going above it look incredibly slim. And I think this is something that was said to me quite a lot at the uh, at COP in, um, in Glasgow by other colleagues from, or well, other people from elsewhere outside the, the global north typically. Climate change is not a threat, it's a reality. And, th and the opening day of COP, here's a couple of quotes. There were lots of quotes given on the opening day of the COP and they're reported by what's called the UN News, United Nations News. They stopped counting the, uh, the death, uh, when the death toll reached 6,000, but there are 1,600 bodies still missing. Massive floods, devastating wildfires and rising seas along with countless lives they take and the livelihoods they upend are realities many nations are already facing. And if you looked at somewhere like Pakistan recently, you look at what happened there. Now, admittedly, that was certainly a, a very strong climate change signal in that, but also the way the flooding was actually organized in the country was also very much a political decision. So again, these things play on top of each other. Um, and but. They're sort of, if you, if you like, people will be sometimes to say, well, that's just anecdote. What does the science tell us? Well, it's, it's usually a fairly conservative organization, the IPCC, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So this is taken from Working Group 2. Um, and, and, and the notes the word have here that I've bolded. So this is at 1.1 degrees centigrade of warming. Increasing weather and climate extremes have exposed millions of people to um, acute food insecurity, reduced water ins uh, security, and so forth. And look at the countries that it's mostly impacting so far. Typically, Global South countries, typically poorer people, people, typically people who had nothing to do or very little to do with the predicament we face ourselves, find ourselves in today. Uh, losses of food production, access to food compounded by decreased diet diversity have increased malnutrition. Um, again, typically for communities outside those that have caused most of the problem. And the, in all regions, extreme, uh, the, all um, heat events have resulted in um, increased mortality and morbidity. So more suffering and more deaths. So the climate change we are deliberately knowingly producing today when we drive or fly or heat our homes, it is having these impacts today. We are killing people today with the activities we choose to pursue. Um, 
So in, in the work that, with, that we've done with a number of colleagues here, uh, Isaac, Jesse, and now Sophie as well, so if you've got any difficult questions, you can ask them later. Um, we've tended to take a sort of a view that for well below two degrees centigrade, we're looking for what we use in the IPCC, this language of an 83% chance of staying below two. And the carbon budget for that, I think you're probably all familiar with carbon budgets here, hopefully, um, is about the same actually as, a, as an outside chance of 1.5 degrees centigrade. So the probabilities matter. If we can keep it that relevant carbon budget, there's a very good chance of staying below two, and there's an outside chance we might not go above, above 1.5. Um, and the, the, the weakest interpretation, or sorry, the, the most strenuous interpretation is that we want to aim for a 50-50 chance of 1.5, and that gives us a much smaller carbon budget, as I'll come back to in just a minute. So what does the, what does the science tell us? What does the IPCC tell us about this? It's, sorry, it's taking a bit longer to pass them. My screen here is faster than this one there. So, okay. um, so you get lots of tables like this that uh, are in the IPCC. Um, and don't worry about the numbers too much, but what it gives you is if you want a temperature rise, 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial periods, then it, from, from 2020, it tells us for these numbers here, how much carbon dioxide there or thereabouts we can put in the atmosphere. So if you want a 50-50 chance of staying below 1.5, you can put 500 billion tons in the atmosphere from the start of 2020. If you're, if you're happier with two degrees centigrade, and I would have a guess that people in the global south certainly are not, then you've got 900 billion tons for well below two degrees. And as I said before, the budget for that is the same as an outside chance, a small chance of 1.5. So that's our budget range, if you like. But let's also be clear that these, um, these budgets don't include quite a, quite a large set of feedbacks for a whole set of very good reasons, um, th these Earth system feedbacks. So some are included, but some are not, and most of them are not. And they're not included because they're not sufficiently well understood to actually include in the analysis, in the budgets. But it is worth us as policymakers, as people in companies, as civil society, to be aware that they're there because they have a big risk factor associated with them. Um, and the IPCC do give a value for the Earth system feedbacks that are not included in the budgets. And um, in our view, then, if you, that you should be at least aware that, um, that these feedbacks are there and that they are, they could very likely, they could decrease the amount of carbon budget that we have. They could possibly increase it, but I think at the lower temperatures, that's very unlikely. And the, the amount they reduce it by is quite significant. Um, so you're talking about 40% um, you know, reduction in the 50-50 chance for 1.5 and um, uh, a little bit less for the, uh, for the two degree centigrade. And so, it, it, it cuts the time frame that we have to actually deliver on these carbon budgets significantly. And I personally think policymakers should be aware of that rather than just having it sort of hidden, in, not hidden, but you know, you've got to read the sort of detail of the report to find these things. I think the policymakers need to be aware that we are already being optimistic in the budgets that we actually have. So the budgets that we're using here today, I would say are the absolute maximum you, could, you should really be aiming for. Ideally, something significant less. So let's take the headline budgets and let's adjust them to today, November 2022. So these are the, the two probabilities that we're using. Um, that's the budget that we have left for two degrees centigrade. That's the budget we've got for 1.5. And th these are the years you have. So, you know, 1.5, nine and a half years of current emissions. So if the current emissions stayed static, we'd have nine and a half years. Oh. A bit worrying. Um, that's about half a percent, a bit under half a percent every month for two degrees centigrade and one percent. So every month we're using one percent of the 50-50 chance of 1.5 degrees centigrade, which is not anyway a safe threshold. Every month, one percent of the budget. I think that's really quite damning. So that's things since the start of this year. We've used 10, 10 and a half percent of the budget is gone just since the start of this year. And yet when we actually, what do we hear? We hear Sweden talking about 2045. We hear the UK talking about 2050. And remember, it's not zero in 2045. It's just 85% reduction of the things we're prepared to count by 2045. You know, India 2070. This, this, this relative to 1.5 and 2 degrees centigrade, this is just nonsense. And yet it dominates the discussions within our countries, within negotiations. It's so far removed from what the basic arithmetic of the science tells us. And if you plotted out those pathways, a power pathway for those temperatures, these are the sorts of plots that they would look like. And there's not a lot of flexibility in this. You can't, you can't make the curve move further away. So this is a very good chance for, well, would you call it a very good chance? A 67% chance of 1.5 degrees centigrade. 50-50 chance and um, 
the lower chance, which is the same budget there as the, uh, as the two degrees centigrade. And you, so the budgets get bigger, you get more scope for this. But this is, remember, this is a, at a global level. Um, and of course, in Paris, we're also committed to do all of this on the basis of equity. So we very much bought into this. And this goes right back to the UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention in 1992, that was ratified in 94. So um, you know, this concept of equity has been embedded in every single negotiation ever since then. And this, this, this is despite quite a lot of the we wealthy world, almost all of the wealthy world, deliberately trying to undermine that equity component year on year. But it's still very clearly in there. Um, so following the language in the Paris Agreement, on equity. They use these terms developing country parties and developed country parties. I wouldn't, I don't particularly like either term, um, particularly come from the UK because we're not really very developed anymore. Now perhaps Sweden's heading that way as well. Um, so these are the two sort of categories that, that they use. Um, and although we, that's the work that I'm going to be talking about here and that feeds into some of the other papers that we've been involved with, uh, Jesse, Isaac, Sophie and myself, we are actually trying to refine this now um, with, a, with a new paper that we're working on. So we're not using those categories, we're trying to do it nation by nation. Um, that, and that's some work I say that's ongoing at the moment. But sticking with the Paris Agreement framing, what we have to do is divide the carbon pie between the developed and the developing countries. Um, <clears throat> and we had, a, we had a number of ways of doing this. It was quite a long process, but ba basically there were a couple of criteria in there that the developing countries the, the, the mitigation rates for those should always be less in the near term than the rates reductions we've, or the rates of change we've seen in the developed countries. And it's the same in the, in the longer term that the mitigation rates for the developing countries should never be in excess of what we expect to see from the developed countries. So I probably most people would say these are quite reasonable criteria. But once you put those criteria on there, there's actually not, again, a lot of flexibility. You know, what, what, when you've got tight budgets and some basic criteria, the flexibility you have quickly disappears, which is why things like negative emissions are used to try and bring back that flexibility. So the curves look a little bit like this. This is the developed uh, um, country in developing, uh, developing countries in orange and developed countries in, in blue. Um, and just look at the date. This is for 50-50 chance of 1.5. You're talking about zero fossil fuels effectively here by sometime a decade from now, there or thereabouts. I think you know, we mustn't play overplay the precision. There's a lot of uncertainties in, in every element of the climate science, right the way through to all the other work around that. But still, it gives us a pretty good guide, you know, whether it's 2031 or 2030 or 2032, that sort of time frame. Um, but remember, that blue line that looks more challenging, only 20%, less than 20% of the world's population live under that line, and 80% live under the other line. So though it looks like the poorer parts of the world are getting a slightly easier deal, that's not actually true. Um, I say, we, uh, can you draw different lines? Not very, you know, there's not a lot of flexibility. With, a, with the 1.5 budget, I think there's very little flexibility at all. With a two degree C budget, you've got a bit more flexibility. I would argue, and I think some of my colleagues would argue that probably if you had that flexibility, that maybe that should be given to the, to the economies that are certainly in, in transition rather than the ones that are already very wealthy. So maybe not to the least, um, the, to the poorest countries because they haven't got a fossil fuel infrastructure, so they could hopefully leapfrog that. But for the ones in transition, the Chinese, the Indians and so forth, then I think possibly there's a good argument that's where the budget should go. Um, what's Im important here to remember is that equity without um, practicality is not equity. You can have an equitable framework, a fair framework, but if you can't deliver it, it's not fair. So you've got to then try and finesse these these things, and, and this is difficult, particularly when you're talking to some of the poor parts of the world who quite rightly want equity to be a central part of the analysis. Um, so in our work, what we've actually made out is that, that, with those curves before, is that already the cumulative emissions per person for the wealthy countries remains higher than that for the poorer countries. So there's an element of inequity in that. And we would argue that it's actually it's too late from a purely mitigation point of view to, um, to, in terms of reduction, reducing our emissions, to actually embed equity. It's, we can't do that anymore. We should have started earlier, we didn't. We chose not to, it wasn't, it wasn't forced upon us. We chose not to do it earlier. And so what we would say now is that the, what we need to be doing is the least unjust apportionment division of the budget, but that needs to be accompanied with really major financial transfers um, and you know, well beyond loss and damages, 
but also technology transfers, but also recognize there are lots of things that we can learn from the global south about how to do things much better than we do in the global north. But certainly from a financial and technical point of view, I think the transfers need to be headed in that direction. And I don't mean this 100 billion pounds per, uh, 100 billion dollars per year. I mean, that's just peanuts that we argue over. We're talking, I think we're probably talking trillions per year, but not, you know, it's not the small numbers, particularly if you want the, some of the parts of the world to leapfrog over the fossil fuel era. So let's now look solely at the carbon budgets for the wealthy parts of the world, and let's try and see how we can um, apportion those out. So we're just looking now at the developed countries, which is a much smaller group. Um, so that, that is a focus here. So uh, the arguments we make for the developed countries, you could not, would not want to make for all countries in the world. Uh, we, I say we're working on that separately for now, but there, we, certainly there are big concerns about applying these sorts of methods. So if you use equal per capita, you could use based on your capacity, how wealthy is your economy, how carbon intense is your, um, is your, uh, uh, is, is your economy, how much CO2 per, per, per dollar or per krona, um, how, how, energy inten how carbon intense is your energy system, is it a lot of coal or is it a lot of wind or solar or hydro or whatever, um, human development indices uh, or well-being indices of one sort or another, historical emissions or grandfathering. Um, and now, um, these have all got multiple benefits and drawbacks. So there's no wonderful system out there. But as I say, the practicality has to be factored in. In the absence of practicality, I would argue it's not particularly helpful. So equal, equal per capita, well, that's unworkable for some nations because we are, we've left this so late, even in the developing countries, where, where equal per capita will start to play out really problematically. Um, it can inform the decisions again, but I think it's, it's a real challenge. Based on capacity, um, you know, that ignores that's how wealthy countries are. It ignores um, big differences in the carbon intensity levels of their economies and of their energy systems. Uh, the, the one that just focuses on the GDP, uh, on the um, uh, carbon intensity of the, of the economy, ignores the fact is they've got really rich countries and really poor countries within that. If you just focus on the energy system, that ignores um, you know, other factors to do with your, how big your economy is. Can you afford to make that transition much faster than others? The human development indices aren't really relevant, we would argue, probably within the um, developed countries, because it's quite a small group of relatively wealthy countries, relatively wealthy, um, up to very wealthy. Um, but it's good, maybe one thing you could look at at a global level, historical emissions, they miss out a whole set of factors, but again, need to inform our thinking. And then there's grandfathering, which is the one that we adopt. Um, why do we choose grandfathering? Uh, partly because it captures the virtues of, all, of some of the other methods partially captures them, it only partially captures these things. It, it embeds elements of carbon intensity um, and the intensity of the carbon intensity of the economy, both the energy system and the economy. Um, it makes some allowance for existing infrastructure, both demand and supply. And remember that the demand bit is, we always think about the power stations, but the demand part is really important as well. What infrastructure have we got that, that works because we've got fossil fuels on the demand side. So that's important. It, it, it embeds some elements of cultural lock-in um, and it, it embeds some idea, some sense of the capacity to transition to a decarbonized society from, you know, depending how wealthy your society is. So all of these things are captured to one degree or another. It embeds, I think, simplicity and practicality, at least practicality within the constraints of a very, very tight budget. But let's be clear, grandfathering is, uh, is far from perfect. It's not fair. Um, all we're arguing is a simple approach. It's probably the best that we have. And if you're prepared to refine it a little bit further, which is what we're trying to do now at a, at, a, at a wider global level, then there are probably other things you can do. But the more you add to it, the more complex it is and the harder it becomes to explain. Um, and as time goes on past Paris, grandfathering becomes less and less appropriate because we should really have started in Paris. And if you know, some countries might have started then or might start now, if others start in five years time, that's a bit unfair on the ones that have made the effort so far. So grandfathering is only valid really near the period when we sort of agree that all countries should be starting to do something. And of course, many countries are not. So let's play all of this out and let's um, think what this might, mean, might look like for, uh, for Sweden. Is Sweden showing leadership? That's what we always hear is that uh, Sweden is showing leadership, well, at least we did hear until quite recently. Maybe we're still hearing it now, I don't know. Um, you know, Sweden's emissions are, are down quite considerably from, from their 1990 levels, but we hear the same thing in the UK. I mean, what's interesting, if you, if you go to COPs, yeah, every country in the world is leading on climate change, yet the emissions are still going up, which is a little strange. Either the physics is lying or some of the leaders are lying, one or the other. Um, and so you know, if we take account of aviation and shipping, imports and exports, then you get a very different story. So for Sweden, 
somewhere it's five to ten percent down from what it was in 1990. Um, and that, but that's similar for the UK, for Denmark. I think Denmark's not come down at all, actually, for France. So there are no climate progressive countries out there. When you factor in aviation and shipping and imports and exports, there are no climate progressive countries in the world. So that's, I think that's quite a worrying, certainly amongst the wealthy countries, probably not amongst the others. Maybe some people would argue Costa Rica and so forth. But. So within the developed country budget, how much should Sweden get of that? What's the proportion Sweden should get? Well, carrying out the method that um, Isaac and I did uh, in a paper, using the paper um, in 2020, then if you want a good chance of two degrees centigrade, you can see the budgets here, 355 million tons. Sweden's emissions are, um, including aviation and shipping, are probably about 50 million tons territorially. Um, so you can sort of see the, the, how, you know, how fast you'd have to reduce them by if you were to do that. Now, what's in, interesting there, look at the ones in brackets. The, 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 the numbers without the brackets are if you started in January 2022. The numbers in brackets, if you started January 2023, so look how much difference one year makes, particularly under the 1.5 budget. It's just enormous. You realize how rapidly each year we choose to fail, how much that changes the following year. And I think that's a really key message here, that because we've left it so late, every day of failure makes, makes tomorrow much, much harder. Whichever way you look at this, whether it's 1.5 or 2 degrees centigrade, whether it's Sweden, the UK, the US, Australia, Japan, wherever, this is profound and immediate change in our system in so many respects, in way above what governments are ever prepared to talk about. And as I say, I don't particularly like these conclusions, but that's what comes out of the arithmetic. Now, why is this so different to what we hear from our governments? Um, and this, I think it's this, this language of net zero is, is just hugely important. Oh, it's a while to come through again, sorry. It's hugely important here. So this is a phrase that you hopefully you're all quite familiar with. If you're in the UK, we hear it everywhere. No one, whether it's academics or news readers or everyone, they talk about net zero. You say, what do you mean by that? And almost no one knows what they mean by it. They're just using the language because it's become common. So the IPCC didn't use this at all in AR5 in the way that we think about it now in terms of our whole economy. They only used it in relation to passive houses. But in fact, in looking at an AR6, then it's used about a thousand times. And, in, and it's all to do with um, this sort of negative emissions and really passing the burden on to future generations. Um, the Committee on Climate Change in the UK, that in many respects coined this in their fifth budget report in 2015, it wasn't used once, used once in their 20. 2020 report was used between 3,000 and 5,000 times. It's, you know, it's just, we just use it now with stop, without stopping to think. And the academics do that, I think, is a disgrace. Because if academics aren't prepared to think, they should sack themselves and go and get a different job. So our job is to think. So we should not be using language in that sort of loose fashion that we are. Fine to use it if you've really thought it through. But what does it do? It embeds substitution. And as soon as you see substitution, you know that there'll be unscrupulous policymakers thinking, aha, we can get out, get out of jail card free here. So it allows you to swap between the greenhouse gases, between carbon dioxide and methane or nitrous oxide. It allows you to swap sources. So you can swap carbon dioxide from cars to uh, fertilizer from um, nitrous oxide from fertilizer. It allows you to cross, cross decades. So you can have a flight today. That's OK, because we'll plant some trees in the north of Sweden in 2030 that'll absorb the carbon dioxide. So it assumes that a tonne is a tonne is a tonne, which is great from an accountancy point of view on a spreadsheet. But in reality, they've got different chemistries, they're different atmospheric lifetimes, and big different levels of, of certainty and risk between these things. So I keep forgetting it's been delayed. The other thing it does, it embeds in huge quantities of carbon dioxide removal. There are no scenarios out there, the high level scenarios, that do not assume this. And by this, I mean, we were expecting future generations, well, our own children and future generations, to absorb huge quantities of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, either through technologies that barely exist today, just at small pilot schemes or in some academic's imagination, um, uh, or so-called nature-based solutions as well. You dismiss that. Um, it's probably doing it on Zoom, all your live comments come through. Um, and the scale of this must not be underestimated. Remember, this is in every single major model. We're talking about hundreds of billions of tons of carbon dioxide removal are assumed in the future when we're all retired or dead. You know, hundreds of billions of tons. So roughly the same size as the current global oil and gas industry. So it's an industry that doesn't exist that every scenario assumes will look as big as the oil and gas industry today. It's that sort of scale. And so they don't exist today at any scale. Yes, I think, uh, I won't go through this one in length, but yes, I think we should research these things and possibly deploy them if they meet very stringent 
uh, ecological and social sustainability criteria, but let's reduce our emissions assuming they won't work. And anyway, agricultural emissions, we will not get down to zero. From my understanding, we cannot eliminate all agricultural emissions, even if, even if the whole world went vegan and we had no till plowing a field, so we didn't plow our fields, then you still have a lot of emissions, particularly, I think, increasingly from, from nitrous oxide, as we have to put more fertilizer on to get better yields to feed more people, and particularly with the changing climate. So energy has to be real zero. There's no neat way out of that, but all the scenarios assume lots more energy use, fossil fuel energy use, rather, um, way into 2050 and beyond. It's also seen to be a policy, this is the strongest argument a lot of people make, it's a political argument, that it's a, its strength is that it's a policy framework for all. Um, but for me, actually, that vagueness undermines its, its real purpose and allows us to expand the use of fossil fuels. Hence, every scenario out there includes large amounts of fossil fuels, even in 2050. Net zero 1.5 scenarios all include large amounts of fossil fuels. The International Energy Agency scenario includes 25% of the energy still being fossil fuels in 2050. I mean, there's no way that can be reconciled with what the science tells us, unless you rely on negative emissions. But all of this lot of uh, virtuous organizations, all of these have net zero 2050 targets. None of those are intended to stop producing gas and oil in 2050. It's only scope one and two, if you read their reports. Scope three, burning the stuff, is not included. But presumably that's the purpose of, exploit, uh, of getting it out of the ground, is to burn it, unless you're just gonna store it somewhere for fun. All of these countries are looking, right now are looking for more oil and gas. And yet we know from the research, we can't burn half the oil and gas we want. If you want for one point, a good chance of 1.5, you can burn about a third of what we have. So net zero is, first it's not, it's not zero fossil fuels, nothing like it. There's this whole framing that allows us to expand the carbon budget so we can all feel slightly happier in our homes today because we haven't got to make these big changes. It disguises as a sort of a greenwashed business as usual. This is what we've been doing for, for, for decades now, has been in line with our Paris and other equity commitments. Um, and Isaac and I, uh, with another colleague, we did a little bit of work trying to look at what would the Swedish policy or the UK policy indeed look like if it was carried out sort of globally and it would look at like something like two and a half degrees centigrade of warming, if not more. So to conclude, the headline choice for developed countries more widely, not just for Sweden, is that um, if, you're, if you want to ignore international equity, which is what we've done so far, we want to pass a huge burden of climate change onto our children, two and a half, three degrees centigrade future, if not higher than that, renege on our international agreements, then that does dovetail nicely, well, particularly in Sweden and the UK at the moment, dovetails very nicely with our current politics, which is do very little about climate change, it maintains the, the market economic model so we can privatize lots more things. Um, and as long as you get some sort of mitigation, about 5% per annum, at most probably, that we get out of this, and net zero by 2045, then that all fits together. And we just have to hope that our children will forgive us for deliberately scamming the whole system. But if we're serious about this, then we need international equity to be a key driver in our policies. We need to, a huge effort by this generation, and that's why we don't like it, by this generation, um, we need to cut emissions in line with 1.5 um, at the outside too, and that means we have to meet our Paris commitments. But that is a complete change in our structures of our society. We need a massive ramp up in government leadership here, uh, reshaping of mainstream economics. And I would argue that's happened to some degree, but not in a positive way since the banking crisis and then since COVID. So I think mainstream economics is in the air at the moment, but it's not coming down in any way that seems to be particularly sustainable. And we need equity at its core, but you're then talking about 15 to 25% cuts in emissions year on year for developed countries, which sounds impossible. Um, but if we'd started earlier, it would have been much simpler to do. Um, but the equity part, I think, gives us real scope there because within our countries, there are huge differences in, in our emissions. Um, if we are to deliver on Paris, we're going to need to reconsider what does growth mean? What's progress? What is development? We're going to have to ask these sorts of questions about our society, and we don't have a long time to answer them anymore. But hopefully, that's, we've been thinking about it for a while. We need to reframe issues of value and how we reward success. We typically reward success, like if you're a lecturer in a university, you become a professor, you get a large pay, pay increase, which means basically you have a higher carbon footprint. So at the moment, we reward success by giving people more carbon emissions. We need to have an alternative relationship with time. We pretty much ignore the past and we pretty much ignore the future. So there's, there seems to be some sort of rapidly sort of condensing time towards just, just the immediate period. That's not true for everyone, but there's an element of that in our, in our systems that we have, particularly in our economic systems. We need to think about intra and intergenerational equity. So other parts of the world are suffering the impacts today. Of course, our children will suffer the impacts. Indeed, some of us are now. Uh, as well. And we have to have a much, much deeper 
appreciation, and this comes from ongoing discussions with Isaac, I wasn't sure how to phrase this years ago, but the, the more than the human world, of which of course we are a small part, and by no means I think an essential part. Um, this is taken from the IPCC again, that sort of relatively conservative, conservative organization, and I don't think we could say it any better. Um, Targeting a climate resilient, sustainable world involves fundamental changes to how society functions, including changes to our underlying values, our worldviews, ideologies, social structures, political and economic systems, and power relationships. I mean, it, it's, in other words, throw it all up in the air and start again. And that's from the IPCC, which I, I'm amazed that ever got past the, the lawyers, because um, it's very carefully checked when these things are published. But anyway, that quote is in there from Working Group 2, and I think that captures the essence of the sorts of changes we're talking about. So on that note, thanks for listening. Thank you, Kevin, for that presentation. Um, very interesting to hear, and we will hear more about it during the day. Uh, now it's been time for Thomas Hahn to come up. Thomas Hahn is an associate professor of eco ecological economics at Stockholm Resilience Center. You were asked to come here and uh, to comment on Kevin's work. Yeah, for five minutes, I think. Yes. And then there's a public discussion, and then I have a seminar with I have a seminar with Kevin after this in half an hour, in 25 minutes. But now I'm supposed to just have and you just click on the side. four or five slides. Here, comments, yeah. Um, I'm an ecological economist from the um, Landbruksuniversitetet, the Agriculture University here in Uppsala. I work in Stockholm Resilience Center now. Here, if you look at the global emissions um, around uh, 40 billion tons, and you want to have the 1.5 degrees with 67% probability, and action is starting in 2022. That means it's 6% or 5.88% per year if we accept an, an, an um, linear reduction. So this is what we have to do at global level. So this is the challenge uh, at the global level. Mm -hmm. And if nothing is done, until 2025, and then of course we need a much faster reduction, 9% uh, per year. This is when we express things in a linear reduction. And uh, Kevin was just talking about uh, other um, percentages because um, he's using uh, exponential reduction. And mathematically that means the double, um, or almost double, depending on on when you reach zero, because you never reach zero when you have asymptotic curve here. And, and the, the, <clears throat> the exponential reduction uh, assumes a very fast reduction in, in the first year, and then you have the same 10% from the previous year. So it's smaller reduction in tons every year. And uh, this is the, the common way to express this mathematically, how, how the rate of change mathematically, exponential growth, and here's exponential um, de, um, reduction. Um, often we talk about linear reduction instead. So then 5% linear is the same thing as 10% exponential if we have the same carbon budget. And we're doing the same carbon budget in these things. So here, here's the 400, 400 gigaton carbon dioxide as a carbon budget. So here is linear reduction. So you, it's important to understand that when you talk about um, percentage annual reduction, we must be clear about is it linear or is it exponential? And the European Union in the emission trading system, they talk about li the linear reduction factor. It was 1.74% uh, every year. And then uh, the European Parliament, I think it was last year or something, changed it to 2.2% every year. And that is a linear reduction. So it's called LR, LRF, <laughs> the linear reduction factor. <clears throat> So that is a common way to express it as in a way that people understand it. And I don't think people understand when you say 21% reduction. It sounds like it's going to go to zero in five years. But it's not. It's, it's, uh, so I think, I think that's the way how we explain things. And I, I talked to many, many people, many researchers, and uh, there seemed to be an agreement that the linear thing is more pedagogic, is more how people think. But the, the red line is more 
scientific. That's how many uh, physicists and uh, economists uh, express rate of change. Um, what I'm doing in my research is to calculate um, equal per capita. And it's very common, as Kevin showed, it's one of the most common ways to, to allocate among countries. But then we go back to, to 1990. Uh, because we think that our grandfathering is not a fair principle um, in um, ecological economics and, or environmental economics. Grandfathering is typically seen as the most unfair distribution. And the reason why we do it, uh, also in emission trading system, the first five years it started with grandfathering because it's feasible. Uh, you start from where you are, so it's realistic in a way, and then you approach uh, industries or countries where they are. So all the roadmaps start from grandfathering because you start from where you are. It doesn't mean that it's fair that some countries have very, very high emissions per capita. Is it fair that the United States have three times higher than Sweden per capita? and therefore they should have three times more allocation than Sweden. Well, we can argue that. So generally it's not fair, but it's, it might be feasible. And the common but differentiated responsibility and respect to capabilities principle. There is no unique scientific answer to this. It's an ethical issue that is worth a sincere public discussion and political negotiation. So we cannot really answer this in a scientific way. So here, I just assume that uh, we, we are choosing this historically equal per capita, and Kevin is talking about grandfathering. And there's no correct and wrong answer. So there's different ethical positions and the trade-offs between this. So we are trying to, ac to account for historical emissions um, by going back to 1990, uh, the first year of, um, well, it was just before IPCC started, and UNFCCC started in 92, but these were the first reports coming out that global change, climate change was accepted at the international politics. We had also liabilities for all the rich countries, high income countries, to make up for mitigation failure. So if you, if you fail to meet your <coughs> territorial reduction of emissions, uh, then you need to have sometimes compensate that. Um, so that's both the liabilities to invest in, in negative emissions and liabilities to, to invest in developing countries to invest in solar and wind power and other ways to have a clean development. And uh, I do, I do uh, totally agree with, with Kevin that you should keep this apart. You should have a, a carbon budget that is only for fossil carbon for many reasons. Uh, because we should not include net zero, we should not include this net negative stuff in the carbon. Because it's very confusing to see what is actually reducing here and what is compensation. And also tree plantation, you only, <laughs> you only fix carbon dioxide in the trees. That's part of the biosphere. And what's in the trees will be, will be back in the atmosphere after 50 or 100 years. If you store it back in the lithosphere, then it's real going back to where you take it from. Because fossil fuel is taken from the lithosphere. And it's the only way you can put it back is carbon removal when you go back to the lithosphere. So this, um, you mentioned, uh, Kevin, uh, uh, nature-based solutions. I, I think that nature-based solutions are good, but it's not real. It's not real coming back to the lithosphere because we're just planting trees and that's not a real compensation. So we should keep this apart. So that's why we are doing this calculation for only fossil fuels. And then when we see how some countries have really very difficult to, to make this equity, then we go back to feasibility. How can this be sorted out? So what kind of help do, do different countries need? What help does Saudi Arabia needs? Because it's very difficult for them. What help does Australia, Canada, United States, America, and Russia? Those are the high emitting countries per capita. And they have real problems to get up with this, with this equal per capita principle. So then we can discuss what help they need and how they can compensate, because some of these countries are very rich. They are very high GDP per capita. So they might be liable to do a lot of these things to finance really negative emissions or to finance investment in solar and wind in developing countries. So we do this feasibility in the second part. So we first start with, the, with the, what we think is fair, uh, just and then we discuss okay 
this is difficult for some countries. How do we solve that? Okay. Okay. That's the start of the discussion. Yes. So I will continue with these things and how what we have done in, in, in our uh, seminar afterwards. Yes. So uh, on this point in the program, we have uh, around 15 minutes for discussion and questions on this. Uh, the debate between Kevin and Thomas will continue. Uh, I will let Kevin just quickly give a short reply if you want now, or do you want to save it for after the break? Yeah. Let's open up to questions. So uh, if you're with us on Zoom, uh, you're happy to uh, raise your hand and, uh, and have a question for us. I will try to put you up here on the screen. And uh, the people here in the audience uh, is welcome to participate as well. And you just raise your hand, basically. Do we have any questions in the audience to start up with? Yes, one up there. Uh, and you will just tell me the question. I'll, I'll have to recite it for the audience. Yeah. So it was a question to Thomas uh, about nature-based solutions and his critique, sort of. Yeah. Are there any nature-based solutions that could actually compensate? In general, because it's a part of thinking and ecosystem services and, and having um, co-benefits and so on. Um, but it, it should not be mixed with fossil fuels. Uh, so in this case, I agree with Kevin that we should not, because um, planting trees and uh, store and forest is one of the complementary measures that uh, obscures the, the clarity. So when you mix those things with fossil fuels, then you mix the, the long cycle with the, lith the lithosphere, with millions of years of fossil fuels, with the short cycle and fast cycle in the biosphere. So therefore, that, there should be two different currencies, and you need to have two different policies. So policies for for more carbon storage in the soil, on ag agricultural soil, and in forests, and then leave it in the ground for the fossil fuels. So, um, so that the argument was just having two different currencies. So I, I think we totally agree on that. We don't mix these things. Or what do you think? Uh, we agree to a part, to, to, to a certain level there. Um, so your point on soils is really important, that we just assume when you plant a tree, the tree as it grows absorbs carbon. But it also has an effect on the soil, and a lot of carbon is in the soil. And if you plant trees in the in the in, in appropriate places, you can actually mobilise the carbon that's in the soil. So, if you want to, the best thing from a carbon point of view is to restore existing forests, low quality forests, make them better quality forests. The next thing is to look at areas that have recently been deforested, and you can replant those. But if you go to some of the pasture lands and so forth, which in the models are often also reforested, then you can cause a lot of problems from emissions from the soil. But where I think we may disagree, I don't care about the accounting from that. I don't think we should be accounting for it. Forests and trees should be part of an, our thinking about, about the ecology of our planet. And I probably wouldn't, we, maybe just the language here, I wouldn't use ecosystem services. Just, so I, I used to have this sort of simple phrase, you know, plant trees for good tree reasons. Do not plant them for some bean counter to use in their spreadsheet to do with carbon. So I don't really care about the carbon from the trees. I care about the sort of ecological benefits, which are not easy things to measure. Um, from, from the forests. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, yes, can I just have one from Zoom before we uh, continue in the audience? Is there anyone on Zoom who has raised their hands uh, to uh, have a question? And I will have our technician flag if anyone wants to. No? Nothing on Zoom? Okay. Then we'll continue in the room. Uh, no, 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 it's okay because we have the big camera up there and we hear you fine through the mic. Thank you. Yeah. We are talking about a CO2 budget. And I hear often uh, the CO2 is often combined with all the, um, the good things we think about in our life. We can eat meat, we can travel, we can... That... To, to, to cut that will be a very um, uh, opinion against that. So the idea is, why don't we go to the other 
greenhouse gases, which are more uh, aggressive, like methane, like nitrogen. Methane could be perhaps uh, much easier captured and closed and, yeah, used. So the question, yeah, you, everyone on Zoom heard that. Uh, I'll leave the mic to you. Um, yeah, that's a really important point, and I think it needs, you need, there's a lot in that, so trying to keep it as quick as possible. The carbon budgets we have already make very optimistic assumptions on the other greenhouse gases. So the budgets we're using here, that, Tom, we're, that we're both using from the IPCC, assume significant reductions in methane and methane atmospheric concentrations. Now, what we know at the moment is the concentration of methane is going up very rapidly in the atmosphere. We don't know why. There are three reasons for that. We think one is to do with from fossil fuel production, methane leak from that. Another one is the, the chemical in the atmosphere that cleans out the methane may not be quite so effective for various reasons, which means the methane might last a bit longer. And the third one is because the planet is warmer. Remember, if it's warmer by a degree, then in some parts of the world on land, it'll be two and two and a half degrees warmer. Then the actual activity, biogenic activity, could be releasing more methane, almost certainly will be. We can't control that. So already, I think we've been overly optimistic about methane anyway. So the carbon budgets we have here are, I would say, the you know, we, we should not be going anywhere, anywhere higher than those. They are the absolutely, you know, the maximum we should be, we should be delivering to because they always take, already take account of these, these wider issues. We have a question that came in through the Zoom chat from Frida. Since the budget is so tiny and we will soon run out, how can we keep municipalities and nations engaged and active using the concept of CO2 budgets, in your opinion? Because um, with the budget, we get a natural science basis for understanding how, what is the room for, for, for improvement, what is the, 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 urge, the, urge, the urge comes very clear when you have a budget. So I think that's even more important when we're running out to understand that. There are no nice, neat ways that we're missing here. I mean, whatever, whatever method you use, if you want to stick within certain temperatures, remember those temperatures are about impacts, and those impacts are about real people dying from climate change and suffering from climate change, along with other ecosystems. You know, we're just using the budgets as a way to think about trying to stop that level of impact. Now, you know, there are other ways we could look at this, but whatever way you do it, it's going to be massive changes to our society. Yeah, we should have done this earlier. We didn't. We're in this position because we've lied for 30 years. That's, that's what comes of not telling the truth, but we have to face it now. No, yeah, one question over here. Just pass the mic. Thank you. Uh, more on the detail of how you argued about linear and exponential curves. I thought it was interesting. Uh, so I, as I understood you, you argued that it is more intuitive to a society, I guess, to understand the impacts of a linear curve. So you said that we otherwise would assume, for instance, that we need to cut all emissions in five years. That would be the intuitive way of understanding what's suggested in an exponential curve. And then my question would be, isn't it more important we have our budget? And this is about how we... How we, how we suggest that we are supposed to use it in the future, not influencing the budget itself. Isn't it more important to find us, um, to suggest a reduction uh, method that is realistic rather than the, what is optimal pedagogically? So either you have this exponential curve, I might argue is more realistic, but maybe not so intuitive. What is the... Uh, important perspective here. What is the important perspective here? Yeah, I when I, I, I looked at some countries' uh, NDCs, the National Determined Contributions, that, that all the countries are supposed to deliver to UNFCCC, and uh, they look more or less like a linear facing out curve. So when you are doing roadmaps um, popular for countries or for organizations, companies, uh, unless you have one very major uh, low-hanging fruit you can do this year. Um, and if you have that, then you might have a, 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 this um, uh, exponential reduction. If it's very easy to do very you know, simple things in the first years. But uh, in most, most countries and most of the roadmaps, they, are, they look more like um, a linear facing out. So I think from empirical reasons, 
it's it's better to talk about linear phasing out. And when you say five years, five percent per year, to most people that means oh, in twenty years we will have gone, gone to zero. Because you think about a bank loan <laughs> that you have to pay mortgage maybe five percent of that, and after twenty years you paid everything. Uh, but if you say five percent here with an exponential curve, that takes forty years. So it's a bit aha. Uh -huh. So 5% uh, does not have the effect that you think. So I think both for, for intuitive reasons, pedagogical reasons, and for empirical reasons, if you look at the NDCs, they are more or less linear. And especially the emission trading system in Europe. But that's, of course, that's a construction. When that is they are reducing 2.2% per year based on the first year. So you always have to say percentage based on the first year, on the start year. Because otherwise you think, aha, uh -huh, uh, based on the previous year. So then it becomes exponential. I discussed this a lot with many, many researchers during the summer and researchers' desk. <laughs> and we came to this conclusion. Uh, there's no total agreement, but, um, but yeah. So in science, people still use um, exponential growth quite often. But when you try to talk about communication, then the linear phase out is more common. Um, just in, in the curves that we that we developed previously, what we also did we had a we didn't assume immediately it starts coming down because it, that's not going to happen. So we have a bit of a rollover. So it has to now as soon as you have a rollover, that's a degree of realism in that we let's assume we're going to do something about it. But it'll take us a little while to do it. We've got political inertia, technical inertia, social inertia. But as soon as you roll over, you take out the bottom bit of the curve. So the bit that goes off like this now disappears because now because it takes you a bit more here. You have to take that bit of curve and shove it up here. So in actual fact, the practicality of the curves that we do is, is, is not much different from yours, except for you've got this rollover section. So I think it adds a sort of a realistic element to it. And I think the bottom end of the curve anyway, we don't really know what's going to happen there. So one of the arguments that economists use is that you get um, diminishing returns. It gets harder and harder to get the last little bit out. But there are other ways you could argue that. You could say, well, why on earth would you want to be getting fossil fuels out if you're only getting a little bit? Because it costs you a lot of money. It's fine. You build a big oil rig if you only get loads and loads of oil. If you only did a little bit at the end, just shut it down because it's so expensive. So I think there are arguments you could just cut off at the end. So there are, we don't know happens, what happens exactly at the end, but we do know what happens at the beginning, and it'll take a little bit of time. And so therefore, I think that any practical interpretation of it gives something like this. For 1.5 degrees centigrade, there's almost no flexibility. A little bit of inertia, then it's pretty much a straight line down. Um, I think in the time frame we have to deal with climate change or probably all other issues, I don't think we're going to get a global sort of world government. But I do think that we could and we should, and I would argue almost as far as we have to, have some way of allocating out, if we are serious about these, uh, these temperatures, which are all to do with impacts, some way of allocating out the carbon budget. And I think that, that is something we have to be more serious about, is how we do that. And that discussion has been fudged at every single COP, and the physics doesn't care here. We have to get that sorted out. So that is a global issue, but that's not global governance, because then how we do that in each country will vary. How Sweden lives within its carbon budget is up to Sweden. China will do it this way, Japan will do it its way, the UK will try its inimitable style. So every country will, will need to use its culture, its geology, its resources, its labour in the ways that most be, the best fit within that country. And I think that is very much up to each country. But how you divide the budget is something that has to be decided. Ultimately, it's going to have to be decided at some sort of global or at least very significant numbers of the country, countries coming together to decide on that. Otherwise, the temperature will just keep going up. Yeah. <clears throat> Brief, I think we have good examples from the, from the, 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 the CFCs when this was phased out after the Montreal Protocol. Um, I think the world was using World Trade Organization. So they, they, most of the countries accepted the phasing out or the total uh, abolishment of CFCs. And uh, the few countries that didn't were boycotted economically. So, so we use some kind of global governance in the trade system to, to boycott those countries and to, to punish them. Of course, that was a t simple technical solution because there was a technical fix of that problem. Um, I think otherwise, uh, as Kevin says, I mean, the, the democratic the accountability can only be met at the national level because we don't have any democracy at the global level. It would be very difficult to imagine a global governance. But we need to have similar things like in smoking, when we understood in most of the countries, in, in the Western world at least. I was a student at that time, 30 years ago, during the neoliberal era. 
I was so impressed by the government that just prohibited smoking in public areas. And they, they knew one thing, passive smoking kills. That was a scientific fact from the, from the doctors, from the medical doctors. And that was sufficient to, know the under, to understand the scientific fact that passive smoking kills, and then just prohibited this. Now we know that passive fossil fuel combustion kills. Very much, people are, people are dying all, 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 over the, all over the world, especially in, in um, very uh, warm countries where contribute contributed the least to global warming. So when we know this, I think we can, we can ask more uh, courage from, uh, from governments.